A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So, Boleslav II's eldest son, Boleslav III, takes over as duke over this now united Bohemia in 999. He is known as Boleslav the Redhead. But he's pretty weak. And his younger brothers, Oldzich and Jaromir, constantly conspire against him, and they manage to depose him just three years later in 1002. How do they do this? Why, they get help from the Vrshovsi clan, who don't mind doing things for power, influence, and money. So the two brothers depose their brother, Boleslav the Redhead, or now sometimes he's known as Boleslav the Blind, because he didn't see this coming. Boleslav flees to Regensburg to be protected by the Germans. Now, there's a Polish duke also named Boleslav I, and he decides he's going to put a relative of Boleslav the Redhead, or Blind, on the throne of Bohemia, which is now kind of under Polish influence. So he does. He puts Vladivoy. But Vladivoy is a drunk, and he drinks himself to death before the year is out. In 1003, Boleslav the Redhead returns and takes the throne back. His brothers, Jaromir and Oldrich, they run off to Germany now, but not before Red manages to castrate Jaromir. They get protection from King Henry II, and Boleslav the Red, finding out that the Vershovsi clan had been part of the revolt against him, decides to massacre them. So now Boleslav the Redhead is now just known as Boleslav the Red for all the Vrshovtsi blood he spilled. As a result of this, he loses most of the support of other nobles in the area. The few Vrshovtsi that do survive run up to Poland and ask Polish Boleslav the Brave for help. He agrees, and he invites Boleslav the Red to come visit his castle, probably in Krakow. Polish Boleslav then has Czech Boleslav blinded and imprisoned. So now, Boleslav of Bohemia really is Boleslav the Blind. He will remain in prison for 30 years, where he eventually dies. So now, Polish Boleslav, Boleslav the Brave, he just takes the dukedom of Bohemia for himself, calling himself Duke Boleslav IV. He manages to hang on to the throne for a whole year until Jaromir, who'd been castrated, manages to come back with troops and support from the German king, Henry II, and kicks him off the throne. Now we've got sibling rivalry on steroids. We got Jaromir on the throne from 1004 to 1012. Then Oldrich, his brother, comes in from 1012 to 1033. Then Jaromir takes it back in 1033 to 1034. And then Oldrich gets it back again. This is like Game of Thrones without the dragons. So, Jaromir takes the throne without his testicles. Part of the deal he cuts with King Henry of Germany is that Bohemia will now become a vassal state of King Henry's. So Bohemia is now firmly under the control of the Holy Roman Empire. But the Polish, because Boleslav the Brave from Poland had been on the throne for a while, basically still control Moravia, Silesia, and Sorbia, so his kingdoms may be a little smaller than he would have liked. Anyway, Jaromir supports Henry II with his war with Poland, because he'd like to get those lands back. And the German-Polish War of 1002 to 1018 is long and nasty. But even though he totally supports Henry II and all of this, he gets nothing for his loyalty. His brother Oldzich, who'd been in exile in Poland, returns to Bohemia, leads a revolt against him, dethrones him, has him blinded, and then exiles him. So Jaromir is not just castrated, but now he's blind as well. Oh, and homeless. Now, Oldrich manages to bring back some stability for a little bit to Bohemia. He gets the remnants of the Vrshovtsi clan under control. He gets Moravia back from the Poles with the help of his own son, Przeciwslav. 
But Przeciwslav and Oldzik have problems with the Holy Roman Emperor Conrad II when they try to expand into Slovakia around 1030. This ends up with them refusing to supply troops on the Holy Roman Emperor's side during a big battle in 1031, which displeases Holy Roman Emperor Conrad II quite a bit. In 1032, Oldzik is invited to take part of the Hoftag Diet in Merseburg. Uh, These diets are informal meetings where selected princes and dukes and the like would discuss sort of the state of the union and future plans for the Holy Roman Emperor. But Oldrich knows that he's in trouble for not supplying troops, and so he doesn't show up. He's also pissed off at the Holy Roman Emperor for not supporting him against the Hungarians. The fact that he doesn't show up pisses off the Emperor, because apparently, even though it's worded as an invitation, it's really more like an order. But Conrad is busy with problems in Burgundy, in France. So he sends his son, Henry III, to arrest Oldrich, which he does. Oldrich is then taken to Bavaria and imprisoned. Henry brings back blind and castrated Jaromir, who once again becomes Duke of Bohemia. But Oldrich's son, Pcetislav, keeps petitioning the emperor to release his father. And so the next year, Oldrich is pardoned. He promptly goes back to Bohemia, dethrones his brother again, and has him imprisoned at Lisa nad Labem. He also drives Yaramir's son out of Moravia because he figures he's just going to keep causing trouble like his father does. Whew, everything seems like it's going okay. However, a year later, Oldzik suddenly dies on November 9th, 1034, after being struck in the head by someone. The safe money is, it's probably someone in the employ of Yaramir. Now, technically, Yaramir, who's still in prison, should yet again become Duke of Bohemia, but instead he renounces it, giving it to Oldzik's loyal son, Pjetislav, probably hoping that then Pjetislav, grateful for being given the dukedom, will then release him from prison. Ha ha ha, he doesn't. And the next year, Yaromir is assassinated almost exactly one year after his brother's death by a member of that pesky Vershovtsi clan. So now, Pjatislav, good son that he was, he gets to become Duke. Now, he's certainly a Pchemus lead on his father's side, but his mother was a low-born concubine, and this made it hard for him to get a wife. So, way back in 1019, he kidnapped one, Judith of Schweinfurt. However, they ended up getting along pretty well, because I guess this wasn't that uncommon. And even though they didn't marry for some time, they apparently quite loved each other. But anyway, Pjatislav certainly knew his stuff. He helped his father take back Moravia from the Poles way back when. He had a great plan to drive the Hungarians out of Western Slovakia. That didn't happen, but it was still a great plan. And he got his father released from prison. Now he's Duke, and he helps the Holy Roman Emperor fight against the Sorbs in 1035. He invades Poland in 1039, capturing the city of Poznan and sacking the city of Gniezno. While in Poland, he manages to get lots of religious relics to take back to Bohemia, including those of St. Adalbert and Radim, both of whom used to be members of that troublesome Slavni clan and are now saints. On the way back home, he also manages to take Silesia from the Poles, including the city of Wrocław, which was founded way back when by his relative Wrocław. So all this triumph gives him the nickname the Bohemian Bohemian Achilles. 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 However, when you have something, other people get jealous. So, in 1041, King Henry III, a German, besieges Prague, which causes some nobles to rebel, as well as the Bishop of Prague at the time. So, Pjatislav has to surrender, ceding his claims to Moravia, and he has to recognize Henry II as his lord. Henry then gives him Silesia as a kind of a consolation prize. Six years later, in 1047, Henry becomes Holy Roman Emperor, and he negotiates a lasting peace between Bohemia and Poland. In exchange for being paid an annual tribute, the Poles promise they will never again attack Bohemian lands. Inside Bohemia, the Bohemian Achilles manages to establish some good and hard fast rules for Christians, including, look, don't work on holy days and no polygamy. I know that in the old pre-Christian days we could, but now we can't. He also manages to get Moravia back again under Bohemian control, and he splits it between his three sons. 
He also changes the rules of secession to favor the current Duke's brother, if there ever was one, over sons, thinking maybe this will stop some of the infighting and getting older and more mature people on the throne. Now, this will become a serious problem, this. The next person in line is a brother, if there was one, not your sons. And this is going to go on for quite some time. This rule technically remains in place until Bohemia gets a king. However, despite coming up with this rule, he had no brothers. And so, his eldest son, Spitaniev II, takes over when he dies in 1055. Spitaniev II rules 1055 to 1061. And one of the first things he does is he immediately, knowing the new rules of secession, bans his two brothers from government. Even though, after he dies, his brother Otto gets Moravia and Vratislav takes Bohemia. In addition to this, he also arrests 300 Moravian nobles who all supported them. Brother Vratislav manages to escape this arrest and flees to Hungary. Now, Spitniev had spent some of his childhood as a hostage of the German court back when his father was arguing with Henry III. This was commonplace. You'd take somebody's son and to make sure that they didn't cause too many problems. Spitniev knows people in Regensburg because he spent most, so much of his childhood there. He goes to Regensburg for his imperial confirmation of being Duke. And then when he returns home, he promptly expels all Germans from Bohemian-held lands, including his mother, Judith. Until his death in 1061, Germans were not welcome in Bohemia. This will start another theme that echoes throughout Bohemian history. Germans are not Germans. Continuing to clean house, or maybe he's just settling scores, he also expels all the monks from the Sazava Monastery, which is about 30 kilometers southeast of Prague, in 1056. Even though this irritates Pope Nicholas II, the Pope makes a deal with him in 1059, giving him the right to wear bishop's clothes as a sort of an official uniform, provided that he pays an annual payment of 100 marks. This guy seems kind of like a weird, angry guy. Sometime around 1060 or so, Vratislav and Spitaniev make up the two brothers. Since they both know that because of the change in the rules of secession, Vratislav is going to become Duke of Bohemia anyway. Spitaniev dies in 1061, and Vratislav, in fact, becomes Duke. I mean, my God. This would easily be four seasons, if not more, of a TV miniseries. All of this story up to now has been just filled with all kinds of double crosses and alliances and promises being broken and so on. It's very exciting stuff. It's got two whole families getting almost totally wiped out. Talk about your red wedding. You'd think the Pchemoslid family, having been through 150 years of borderline chaos, and realizing that since they're in the middle of it all, everybody wants to take a piece of their pie, you think that they would just calm down. But they don't. And that's what we'll talk about on the next History Podcast for Prague Times. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it, or share it, and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times.